Hello, uh, welcome to um, the uh, section 1.2 video lecture uh, for statistics. Uh, once again, I'm Dr. Scott Spaniel. I'm in your, your instructor for this course. Um, and today what we're going to do is we're going to cover section 1.2, which talks about the two most common uh, types of um, ways we collect data for statistical analysis, observational studies and experiment, uh, design experiment. And we're going to delve a little deeper into um, well, we're going to look at the differences between the two a little bit, and we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the types of observational studies. So, um, just like for the last video, you can go ahead and take out your chapter one handouts to follow along or take notes with me. Uh, if you can't, don't have access to that or can't print it off, um, feel free to just write, uh, take notes in a notebook. Um, and those uh, notes ca uh, sheets can be found either in Blackboard under this week's um, folder or on my math lab depending on the format of your course. So let's go ahead and open those note sheets and you can get started. Now one actual note I just thought of while um, as a tip for anybody who's using uh, has an iPad if you happen to have one that's how I make these videos. The app I'm using here is called Flexel. Uh, to take my notes that you guys are following along with. Um, so if you have an iPad and you're trying to take notes with this, I find this one works really well. Um, it's an app available in the App Store. So anyway, let's get started with today's notes. So in research, we wish to determine how varying the amount of an explanatory variable affects the value of a response variable. Uh, you may have heard these called the explanatory variable is often also called the independent variable and the response variable is called the dependent variable. Uh, and so our goal in statistics is often to see how altering one variable changes other variables. There's two basic ways to do this. An experiment measures the value. Oh, sorry. Nope. Got that wrong backwards. Did these in the wrong order. An observational study measures the value of the response variable without attempting to influence the value of either the response or the explanatory variable. That is, in an observational study, the researcher observes the behavior of the individuals in the study without trying to influence the outcome of the study. Um, in other words, you just observe what's already happening. Um, uh, you may t ask questions to help you observe what's happening, but you don't change the values of the explanatory variable. If a researcher assigns the individuals in study to a certain group, intentionally changes the value of the explanatory variable, and then records the value of the response variable for each group, the researcher is conducting an experiment. Or, to be more specific, a designed experiment. Um, and these are preferred when you'd like to be able to um, claim causation because observational studies do not allow a researcher cause claim causation, only association or correlation is another word for that. So here are some examples of things that are either observational studies or experiments. And the question is, which one are they? So we're really looking for, are we observing what's already happening? Or are we trying to change one of the variables um, in order to um, get a result? So the first one here says, a survey is conducted asking 400 people, do you prefer Coke or Pepsi? So this is an observational study because all we did was ask people what they were already doing. Okay, We didn't um, in any way try to change the variables. So then the second question here says seventh grade students are randomly divided into two groups. One group is taught math using your traditional techniques. The other is taught math using reform method. After one year, each group is given an achievement test to compare proficiently. So this is a good example of a design experiment because we um, put people in groups and we deliberately changed 
a variable to see if it would affect another variable. So in this case, the teaching method is the explanatory variable, and the score on the achievement test is the response variable. Okay, so at this point, go ahead and pause the video for a moment and try to decide whether the which of the other uh, which type these last three are, and then hit play when you're ready. Okay, now that you've had a chance to try these, let's go through these together. So while shopping, 200 people are asked to perform a taste test, in which they drink two randomly placed unmarked cups. They are then asked which drink they prefer. This is a good example of a design experiment, which is similar to the first example. The difference here is we're not just asking people what they're already doing. We're creating an experiment where we're altering a explanatory variable, in this case the type of soda, and then we're asking people to choose. The next one says a poll is conducted in which 500 people are asked whom they plan to vote for in the upcoming election. So this would be observational study. Because they're just observing what people are planning to do. We're not changing one of the variables. And then the last one says conservation agents netted 250 large amount back in a late and determined how many were carrying parasites. So this is another example of an observational study. Because... Um, all they're doing is observing what's already happening, and we're observing which fish already have the parasite. Okay, so that's really the key. Are you observing what's already happening, or are you changing things um, to try and see what happens? So, there are a couple other um, variables we're just, uh, I mean, sorry, not variables, definitions we're just going to throw in here because... Um, there's not necessarily another good way, place to talk about them, and we're going to talk about them here in a second. Um, and those definitions are confounding and lurking variable. So confounding happens in a study, occurs when the effects of two or more explanatory variables are not separated. Therefore, any relation that may exist between an explanatory variable and the response variable may be due to some other variables or variables not accounted for in the study. So an example of this... Um, is if you wanted to know what effect does um, taking a diet pill have on weight loss, um, but you didn't worry about variables like uh, amount of exercise, eating habits, things like that, um, you would have confounding. You So even if you saw that the people who were taking the pill lost weight, you wouldn't be able to claim that, um, that it happened because of the pill, unless you take care of those other variables, unless you control for those other variables in some way. Uh, a lurking variable is an explanatory variable that was not considered in the study, but that affects the value of the response variable in the study. In addition, lurking variables are typically related to the explanatory variables cons considered in the study. So one of the things that we'll talk about in the last section of this chapter when we talk about how to design experiments is we will talk about how to control for these lurking variables, for variables that may impact the results but um, are not the explanatory variable we're actually concerned with. So now what we want to talk about is we want to talk about the different types of um, observational studies. So there are three basic types the first of these is cross-sectional. So a cross-sectional, uh, these are studies that collect information about individuals at a specific point in time or over a very short point in time. So this is basically if you did a survey question once, like the guy in the mall asking, do you like Coke or Pepsi? That would be cross-sectional because you're asking a question at one point in time. The second type is called case control. Case control studies, um, these are called retrospective because they require individuals to look back in time or require the researcher to look at existing records. In these studies, individuals that have a certain characteristic are matched with those that do not. This means that we look for groups to be as homogenous as possible. And the word homogenous just means the same, as similar as possible. So case control, cross-sectional, we're looking at one point in time. Case control, we're looking back in time. And then the last case 
That's kind of his cohort. And cohort studies, uh, we first identify a group of individuals, participate in the study, and then we follow them into the future. So you just pick a group of people and then you see what happens versus, um, which is kind of the opposite of case control, where we pick out the people we want at the end and we look back to see what happened previously. And then one other definition, um, just to throw in here, because we need it uh, for this class, but it doesn't really have another great place to go, is a census is a list of all individuals in a population along with certain characteristics of each individual. So hopefully you all have heard the word census a lot this past year because the U.S. is conducting what it calls its 10-year um, uh, census, where we count everybody and collect certain characteristics about it. So... In statistics, the counting is not the census. The census is the list of everybody. Okay? And if you haven't uh, been counted yet for the census, make sure you do. Uh, it's very important that everyone gets counted um, in the census. Okay. So now that we've done that, we've talked about these three types. Let's look at some examples and go through these different definitions that we've talked about here uh, today. So the first one here says... Researcher Penny Gordon Larson and her associate wanted to determine whether young couples who marry or cohabitate are more likely to gain weight than those who stay single. The researchers followed 8,000 men and women from 1995 through 2002 as they matured from teens to young adults. When the study began, none of the participants were married or living with a romantic partner. At the end of the study, married or cohabitating women gained on average 9 pounds more than single women, and married or cohabitating men gained on average 6 pounds more than single men. Why is this an observational study, and what type of observational study? So, it's an observational study because we're just observing what's happening, right? That's all that's happening here is we're observing what's happening. So, what type of observational study is this? Well, there are three options. Did we look at one point in time? Did we uh, look backwards at existing data? Or did we find a group of people and follow them forward in time? In this case, we found a group of people and we followed them forward to see what would happen. So this would be a cohort study. Okay. What is the response variable in this study? Well, the response variable is weight gain, right? The variable we want to see what happens is weight gain. That's the variable that should be responding. What is the explanatory variable? Well, the explanatory variable is the variable we're saying explains this, and so that would be relationship status. Either single or uh, married or cohabitating. Okay, so those are the um, response and explanatory variables. And we could also identify some lurking variables here. One lurking variable could be um, exercise, right? Is it possible that um, the two different groups we looked at in the end, people who were single and people who were married, did they have different exercise habits, um, eating habits, socioeconomic status? These are all kinds of different lurking variables, and you may have others that you came up with that I didn't mention here. And then this last question is just to point out the fact, does getting married or cohabitating cause one to gain weight? And the answer to that is no, because we cannot claim causation from a observational study. Okay, so we all we can say is that they're associated with one another. So weight gain is associated with um, being married or cohabitating. Okay. So at this point, uh, this is the last page of this section. So why don't you all take a moment, pause the video, read through these two problems and see if you can answer these questions on your own before we go through them together. Okay, so now that we've had a chance to go, uh, you've had a chance to try these, let's go through the answers together and then we'll be done with today's section. So researcher Crystal Delmas and Associates wanted to determine if having a television in the bedroom is associated with obesity. The researchers administered a questionnaire to 379 12-year-old French adolescents. After analyzing the results, the, uh, the researchers determined that the body mass index of adolescents who had a TV in their bedroom was significantly higher than that of adolescents who did not have a TV in their bedroom. 
Why is this an observational study and what type of observational study is it? Well, it's an observational study because they simply observed what was happening. All they did was find out who had TVs and what their BMI is. They did not change any of the variables in this study to see what effect that would have. So these, that's why it's observational study. And in this case, the observational study is doing a survey at one point in time. So that was cross-sectional. So this is a cross-sectional study. Okay. What is the response that, um, variable here? So what variable is responding to the explanatory variable? Well, the response variable is BMI. And what is the explanatory variable? Well, the explanatory variable is TV in bedroom or not. Once again, we're dealing with weight gain and um, issues like that. So the lurking variables are very similar to the previous problem. In the report, the researchers stated that these results remain significant after adjustment for socioeconomic status. What does this mean? Well, that simply means that they uh, found that the results still occurred when they looked at people with similar socioeconomic status. So one of the ways to control for a lurking variable is to set it the same for everybody. In other words, look for results for people with the same socioeconomic status. So from similar neighborhoods, similar income, um, similar home situations. And once again, having a TV in your bedroom does not necessarily cause higher body mass index. It's associated with having a higher BMI. Then the last one here, scientists were interested in determining if uh, abdominal obesity is related to coronary artery cal calcification. The scientists studied 2,951 participants in the cor uh, coronary artery risk development in young adults study to investigate a possible link. Waist and hip girths were measured in 1985, 19, uh, 1995, 2000, um, and CAC memberships were taken in 2001. The results of the study indicated that abdominal obesity measured by waist girth is associated with early um, ulcer sclerosis as measured by the presence of CAC per um, part in the participants. What type of ob observational study is this? Well, this is case control. Because what they did is they used existing data and looked back into the past. Okay, What is the response variable here? Well, the response variable is CAC level. And the explanatory variable is waist girth. Okay. So that's it for today's lecture video. Make sure you're doing the homework. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Um, uh, feel free to contact me via Remind or email.